Well, I might start. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is um, Stephen Hewitt. I'm um, ITS, uh, ITS New Zealand's president, and I've got the, the duty of hosting this uh, webinar um, uh, session. Um, and today, we've no, it's really cool to have uh, uh, Juan uh, Kabali and uh, Leo Hortas um, with us today to talk about um, kubes, optimizing kube, curbside or curbside management, which actually is a very important um, subject and, and now and in the future. And I hope they give us some lessons, some lessons learned and some of the things that have gone good and gone bad. And I'll just give you a little introduction. So um, Leo is a project manager with Waverley Council. So that covers the uh, famous Bondi Beach, which we all see in, TV, in our TV quite regularly. Um, he has given up his car, so I was just reading through his thing. So he's a, certainly a, a mobility enthusiast uh, and is looking at an, and is studying architecture, sustainability, urban planning, and, and as you say, project management. Um, and is very uh, keen on looking at new ways of improving our sustainability for future urbanized areas. And also we've got uh, Juan with us, who is the head of solutions for APAC Move It. Um, Juan and I have had a number of conversations over the, the number of months. Um, Juan believes in future transport getting closer to your customers and through a deep understanding of their behavior and, and ultimately providing more tailored uh, services. You'll hear more about um, Juan and in terms of uh, the work that Move It does around digital data. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll let, uh, I assume Juan's going to take over first and then take us through their uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Stephen, for the intro and then thank everybody for your time today. Really appreciate you taking some time out to hear more on the unsung hero of mobility, as we like to call it internally, which is the curbside. It's uh, something we take for granted quite often. We, uh, you know, we get dropped off there, we rush out of stations, we interact with it quite regularly. We picked up our, you know, our loved ones, for example, from the curbside, uh, you know, exchange into other modes. And it's something that, that quite often gets overlooked. And so there's a lot of uh, insights we're going to share with you today, a lot of history, a lot of storytelling on, you know, how this kind of concept of dedicated curbside came to be, what it actually means for, for the council, for Transport for New South Wales and for Move It and how we foresee, uh, how Move It also foresees that it is, you know, part of the future of autonomous vehicles and creating these kind of safe transition spots to get from an autonomous vehicle and back on foot or vice versa. So there's a lot we're gonna share with you today. We'll, uh, we'll try to keep the meeting a little bit shorter than the, the full hour to give you some time back. Um, but without further ado, we'll, uh, we'll quickly just kick off. So a bit more on Move It and, and uh, mobility as a service and, and how this, uh, the physical concept, uh, you know, was converted into the digital realm. So Move It is the world's number one urban mobility app. Uh, we've been around now for about eight or nine years uh, here within the region. So Australia, New Zealand for about six years uh, operating as a consumer app. So, you know, that one app gets you all around the world to plan your journeys from A to B. Very much available in, in New Zealand, of course, as well. We're also an Intel company. So we're part of the larger uh, Intel brand and, and kind of a future uh, vision, so to speak, of connected mobility and really pulling uh, or, you know, urban uh, environments all together. Part of that journey also involves a group that's called Mobileye, which you may have heard of. They're one of the world leaders in ADOS technology, which is advanced driver assistance systems. And they're in buses helping you know, with collision avoidance and kind of lane, uh, you know, lane uh, you know, measures and considerations, but they're also leading the charge with autonomous vehicles all around the world. Trials taking place in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, and, in, uh, in France, in Paris, and other places too. And so Move It helps to bring all of these different aspects of mobility together. And as I quickly mentioned, you know, we, we started this humble journey into mobility as a service by building the simplest and most intuitive mobility app in the world. So we, uh, you know, we started off literally just kind of grabbing open data, creating this one app. Then we went into a crowdsource model, pulled in what, you know, we call our secret sauce. So that ability to kind of capture anything from unplanned incidents happening in the field through to kind of dirty infrastructure like bus stops, et cetera, all the way through to crowdedness on vehicles. And then it continued to scale out from there. So as you're gonna hear more on today, how we could bring in points of interest like a dedicated curbside into the app so people can interact with it, including also things like payments and kind of fulfillment of your journey plans um, and messaging and so much more. So 
very quickly, if we talk about the scale of the platform and I guess our expertise in, in connected mobility and mobility as a service, uh, we're currently up to about 910 million users worldwide that are using the platform. In the early part of next year, we're going to cross that uh, that billion user threshold. So we see a lot of people moving. We, we understand mobility patterns quite well. Uh, and as part of what we do through the app, we collect about 6 billion anonymous data points in any given day. And this is all GDPR compliant. So it's anonymous and, and de-identified and aggregated. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, we get to see mobility patterns. And that's really where, as we start talking about the digital twin or the conversion of the curbside into the digital realm, it's something that we uh, you know, are quite proud of and, and, and can facilitate understanding how people actually used it, where they're actually going, what happens after they've used Pudo Bays. And last but not least, you know, this same app gets you uh, to 112 countries, 3,400 cities around the world and 45 different languages. And equally important for this project, as you're going to hear later on, is over 325 micromobility operators connected into the platform in and around Sydney and, and Australia in Auckland, where we're kind of pushing forward with some uh, with some multimobility studies there as well. But, you know, as you're kind of creating an ecosystem around this curbside of, you know, active shared micromobility, it's really important to have that platform that brings it all together. And that's part of the, the storytelling we're going to share with you today as well. So uh, just really quickly, some of the key topics and concepts for the presentation today, so to speak, setting the scene is, um, is so, you know, what is mobility as a service? And, and it's a kind of buzzword right now. It's a bit of a hot topic. And as you can see here, it's just a type of service that through joint digital channels enables users to plan, book, and pay for multiple types of mobility services. So we spoke about active transport, which of course is now finally coming into apps more and more, micromobility, uh, private transport, and of course, public transport as well, and on demand and how all of these aspects fit together. Payment is, is the next kind of horizon. So integrating it with your existing, you know, um, uh, AT hop card or integrating it with the B card, et cetera, and how that kind of fulfills a journey plan from in the morning when you're planning it all the way through to of course paying and, and, and utilizing those services. The concept of digital twin is also relatively new and it's a digital replica of potential and actual physical assets, processes, people, places, and how that can be pulled in for various purposes. So that's really a key topic of today is how we went from a, a zoned and planned bit of dedicated curbside and how we were able to bring that into a digital app, a digital realm, but even on the back end, how we're modeling how people interact with these particular assets studying it and optimizing those assets. So creating almost like, a, like an ecosystem or a lifestyle of these assets to get the most utilization out of them. Pudo, Pudo is not a bad word as you can see here. It's actually a great word as we're gonna talk about quite a bit today. It stands for pickup drop-off bay. So it's very similar to the concept of a kiss and ride type uh, dedicated curbside, but we're taking that concept away from the schools into the general masses. And once again, to facilitate convenient and safe location transfers and changing of modes. So either from private vehicle to foot, or, you know, for example, private vehicle to foot to public transport. So really finding now dedicated places and premium real estate around cities to help create safer journeys from that perspective. And of course, more convenient. Waverly Council. So, uh, you know, thank you, Stephen, for introducing Waverly Council. So it is home to the world famous Bondi Beach and is the most densely populated council in Australia which is quite interesting. So it gives us a good future study of how as cities get more congested and more populous, how we can use this concept of Pudo Bays to, to really expand out into you know, different sizes, uh, different size urban environments. And then last but not least, what does this mean to New Zealand and why is this important? Why are we sharing our time today to talk, to about, to talk about it? It's because we're, we're, you know, it's ultimately about keeping cities moving. Uh, it's, it's new and creative ways to keep cities moving. So you know, if you have been down to Bondi Beach or if you're any, you know, if you're, any, if you're in any uh, kind of crowded part of the city, you're seeing people jump out of their Ubers, crossing the road, sometimes doing the wrong things, compromising the driver, or potentially even compromising their own health or risk, or risking their own health by crossing the road in such a, a quick fashion. So, you know, it's really important as we study the, this kind of Pudo Bay concept to understand how this can facilitate mobility in your cities. It's also safer, um, you know, safer transitions as, as just quickly highlighted there. And ultimately it's how we can use new mobilities connected to these kind of you know, ecosystems, these kind of Pudo bays to get people once again to easier mode shifts. So whether it's active transport to getting in their friend's car or other means, it's understanding how that all fits together. And finally marrying more of that uh, curbside back into the digital realm and, and you know, shared transit as we see all around the world. So hopefully that gives a, a better kind of overall context. And with that in mind, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Leo, to start talking about Pudo bays and the fiscal asset. 
Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for, for having us. Um, well, as Steven said, I work uh, at Waverly Council as a project manager for strategic transport. And uh, I've been working in this project for almost two years. Um, so the, the, the Waverly context, pretty much if one, if you can uh, press for the next, next slide. Uh, pretty much Waverly Council is uh, quite a small council because we are only 9.2 square kilometers. We are around 75,000 people from which we are uh, around like in the age of young professionals and uh, uh, it's a highly educated um, LGA as well, local government area where pretty much everyone has secondary studies, uh, university studies. So we do have a lot of people that do understand what's happening. And uh, it's a very urbanized area as well. Um, what, what we see in Waverly Council is that we are a, an area that looks a little bit like different cities in Australia and for the case in New Zealand are going to look in the coming years. A more populated, a more vertical development and a lot of issues with the transport. The reason why we have a special case in Waverly is because we do have Bondi Beach, which is extreme, extremely, um, extremely populated, but also we are seasonal. During summer, we can have thousands of people going to the beach. But what happens? We have two commercial centers in Waverly, and those commercial centers are Bondi Junction, where the train station is, and Bondi Beach. But the connection between Bondi Junction and Bondi Beach has to be done by bus. So that, and given that, that, that this is an older area, our roads are not wide enough. So we do have, or at least before COVID, traffic and parking were the most important issues to deal with in Waverly Council. Right now, yep, still important, but um, yeah, we, 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 need to, we need to deal with that as well. Uh, so if, if you wanted to ask a question or something, um, Maybe just not wait until the very end. If you have something that really want to know as I'm speaking, that's fantastic. We try to make it a little bit more dynamic. If you don't want to ask anything, that's fine. Uh, we'll just keep going. Um, now, uh, our transport hierarchy. We have a strategy. This project is supported by the transport strategy, which is called People, Movement, and Places, which is at the same time supported by our community strategy, which is our strategic plan. 2019-2028. So we want to put people first, bicycles, public transport, service vehicles. Then we also want to have our private vehicle, our shared mobility and our private vehicles. So in, in saying that, um, Sydney is not as friendly with bicycles. We've had issues because we don't have the infrastructure, we also have a lot of issues with the new shared mobility, and that's, and that's where we are. We understand that shared mobility uh, is still a lot of cars, like we have working in our, in our LGA, we have Uber, Ola, Didi, and somehow Shiva, uh, but pretty much, Uber, Ola, and Didi are, are, are the bigger players for the vehicles. And we also have some shared bicycles that only reappeared a few weeks ago. And, and that, all that is shared mobility, right? And then we come to the concept of how to integrate shared mobility. It is something that everyone is thinking about. So a couple of years ago, we had a... Um, we, we had an, an idea about a, how to deal with the new emerging technology, the new mobility, and how were we going to do something that is completely unregulated because 
our residents get all the benefits from the shared mobility. But at that time, we had no way of controlling, suggesting, doing absolutely anything about it. So uh, as I was saying, two years ago, the federal government created the Smart Cities and Suburb Grants. That was the second, the second round where we actually uh, proposed to explore mobility as a service. But what happened? We didn't get the grant. So the Waverly Council wasn't going to be funded, but there were a lot of uh, future partnerships on, on the loops and Waverly Council decided to go ahead and keep pursuing this uh, mobility as a service concept. So that's where our State Agency for Transport, Transport for New South Wales, which I understand is uh, somehow different in New Zealand, but this will be the, the state of New South Wales transport entity. Uh, and they decided that they wanted to support Waverly Council with the, with the idea because, and this is one of the things that we want to learn about, mobility as a service, parking, traffic, is not only an issue that the local government has. It's all, what, what we try to do is we try to go to different agencies and see what common objectives we had because we didn't get the grant. We were not gonna have the money, but we had the partnerships. And some of those partners were able to fund some of what we wanted to do. So um, because two years ago, we knew that mobility as a service was a concept that was being pretty successful in the European countries. We came and that's, that's one of the, the issues, right? We went uh, asking for the grant with very, very far away international examples. Yes, WIM is great, fantastic mobility as a service. It works really well, Helsinki, all these cities in Germany, but we didn't really know anything about how mobility as a service could look like in Australia. Uh, that was the first question. That's, that, that, that was, ah, this project was supposed to last and start producing stuff, I don't know, four months ahead. It's been two months and we've only had the pickup drop of base since uh, the first week of August. So it, it took us a, a lot longer. So we started learning about Waverly Council. And that's something that uh, we, we think everyone should do. To make this project happen, you have to understand what's happening in your local area and not really uh, what's happening internationally. It's a good example though. So we understood that there were areas that were very common, no matter the type of shared mobility. And we did it by, I spoke about partnerships. So those partnerships, were also with different transport providers. By that time, we already had a different car share. We had one bus, on-demand bus, and we also had a one company with bicycles. So what we did is we asked them to give us data or reports, and that's how we started to understand about the specific areas that we had to treat. And those areas, um, we found them through the analysis of, of, of data, of their reports. Uh, we signed non-disclosure agreements as well. So a lot of the data uh, lives with us and just it's, it's, it's for, our, for our understanding. But of course, part of building this project is building a framework to work with all the private companies and organizations that do that type of work. So that means that we have to be reliable as well. And we have to let them give us their data without us sharing a, a confidential information. So we went and understood our LGA. We also understood our metered areas, how our meet bar parking meters were working. We also went and checked uh, with all the, um, all the people that were giving complaints and where the complaints were being. So we had to go around council and understand a lot from the rangers. And then we came up with a concept. We said, okay, mobility as a service is a thing. We need integration. Then 
all the services are on the same areas. That means that what we can do is we can create specific areas in areas that are not going to represent too much expenses for council because we understood our metered areas on the curbside. And we came up with the concept of the pickup drop off bay. Um, as you can see now on the, on the slide that Juan has, this is, um, yes, so pretty much the pickup drop off bay uh, can be used by buses, by cars, by bicycles, but any, any person that is going to do a pickup drop off activity. That means kiss and ride, school children, uh, on the phone, anything. And we're also trying to create bike hubs next to them, or at least that helps service them, which is important because we, are, we, are, we want to integrate that as a mobility as a service. Mobility as a service is far, but I don't know how, that, how far that will be. That's why we have a, also work with Move It. If you, if you want, oh, one last thing that we did, we transferred for New South Wales. We created an innovation challenge and they funded that where we were engaging with companies like Move It through Transport for New South Wales and Move It through um, a competition kind of thing, like a, like a hackathon. Uh, they were chosen by Transport for New South Wales to work in this specific project, which was the Waverly, the Waverly Council Challenge. And that's how we've started working together with Juan and, and, and the team in, in Move It. So if you want to go to the locations, Juan, uh, we found different areas. Uh, the left image is around Bondi Beach, as I said, where it's difficult to get on bus. And the other one is Bondi Junction, where, for example, that number nine one that you see there is in front of the train station entry on, 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 on that street. Then there is that uh, number seven, for example, that you see there, that's where the Westfield shopping center is, is one of the most, uh, one of the busiest shopping centers in, in Australia. Um, and then on that number eight, that's the other exit of the, the other exit of the shopping center. And it was incredible to see that every single interaction was mostly going around that area. That's one of the most important areas. And all of that, we only saw through the data. We, we will show you something about the data. Then uh, if we go to the left image on that number one, uh, we had a, a mail zone. So we changed it, we made it a no parking zone. This is one thing, regulatory, the pickup drop of base are no parking zones. Two minutes, five minutes if you're displaying a disability permit, and then you can be, a, you have to be at least three meters from the car, not, no more than three meters from the car. Uh, that was a mail zone. Then that number two was uh, for buses. So we negotiated, we changed it from the buses. That number three is a truck zone that we actually gave an exception to make it a pickup drop of bay because the curbside is so contested, right? So it is very important to find every single little space and then make it work for everyone else. That number five, for example, used to be a single car taxi rank. And we thought that yes, taxi ranks, they're very necessary. They're very important. Taxis are not decreasing. It's just that everyone is using more share mobility. So that taxi rank uh, was taken as well. And then, Mm, that that's about the the pickup drop of bay. So if you want to show the experience photo one, that's pretty much how it looks. So we have a, a, the photo shows a, a pickup drop off activity. So you see this is in front of the train station. The bus behind that's um, specific for the buses to to stop there. Then you see some school children being picked up by the, by, by the person that, that is there. And then you also see this other person in the black car that is actually looking at the, at the, at the sign, at the pickup drop of bag. Uh, the experience, so you see the sign on the left, the bigger sign. It says Puro, but it explains it's a pickup drop of bag. Then we kind of, we, we have a different image for each of them. 
where we have the car and the train because it's around the train station. The one on Hall Street that you see in the bottom left, you have a surfer because that's the one in one of the most popular access points for the beach on Hall Street. And uh, the concept in the middle is pretty much how it was gonna look at the back. Then you have the info box. Uh, you can see the info box in the, in, in, in the photo on the right hand side. That one, we will change information, but it pretty much describes what a put away is. We have a QR code there. We will also put a QR code for a survey and that survey is going to be available in the Move It Up. Um, that's pretty much, uh, you also see the social distancing markers because it, it was important for one of the shared mobility companies to have those ones there, uh, mostly because uh, we also want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Uh, if you want to go to the, to the RS Lite one, that's pretty much how data looks in, in, um, in, in different uh, software packages that, that you can get. Mm, you can see that uh, all of those ones are pick up and drop off activities that we got. And that's a representation that's not, that, that's not real data because as I said, it's protected by non-disclosure agreements. But it tells you, and you can see that when you are at the beach, around the beach, uh, you can see that there is a lot more activity. You can see the residential areas. And um, yeah, th this is pretty much the Bondi Basin area. Um, so that's the data input. And then we need to have someone that does GIS analytics or uh, it's pretty user-friendly now. Um, on, on my background, there is nothing on the GIS area, but we, we managed to do it. Uh, that builds a lot of local knowledge. And then uh, the, the, the last thing that I want to tell you in this last minute is that um, the, the approval process, you, you need to work with different agencies. So it is a little bit difficult and onerous to actually go to different areas. You have to go to directors, to then you have to go to the, the other agency to see if the funding has been secured and all that. But the, rest assured, everyone has the same objective. Yes, we're going to reduce congestion, increase safety, reduce car ownership, and give the benefit to the community, which is pretty much what Waverly Council wants to do. And uh, yeah, that's, that, that, that's, that's pretty much the, the description. And uh, yeah, uh, Juan, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Leo. <clears throat> and I'm really fascinated by this one orange dot here in the middle of Bondi Beach. So <laughs> maybe someone booked it from their watch or, or something, but he's yeah. a very special person, this one. <laughs> Let's talk about quality of data. That's going to take us two years then. <laughs> Indeed. But I think Sisha. it's important. It's, yeah, it must be a surfer on his Apple watch is what I was thinking. Something along the lines of that. But, um, you know, just, just kind of highlighting that. So this process took Leo two years from concept through to approval, through to the challenge, fulfilling the challenge, getting a partner. It's no simple task uh, to go through each of these five individual steps, you know, to understand based on data where these points should be, to, to kind of speak to locals, optimize those locations, figure out where they really need it, get those approvals. So just highlighting that, you know, it's, it's never too early to start reconsidering your curbside and optimizing that curbside is, I think, a, a key takeout from that. But thank you so much, Leo, for, for the insights you shared there. And obviously, thank you uh, for, for kind of even no creating the project and, and picking that battle, so to speak, and making it all happen. <clears throat> from, the, from the Move It side, so Move It uh, was introduced to this particular concept uh, through, as Leo mentioned, the, the Waverly Mobility as a Service Challenge. And so I'll give a quick overview, and then I'll, I'll jump more into some of the details and the experience. But what we, you know, we were very interested in this project, uh, particularly with the future of autonomous vehicles, as I mentioned earlier. So... We'd seen uh, and been involved in several mobility as a service projects uh, all around Europe, in, in Paris, in, in you know, Madrid, in, in Barcelona, in, in certain countries uh, operating on our technology, but we hadn't yet seen it successfully completed or done uh, so far in the APAC realm. And we we're you know, very, very interested to get more involved in transport for New South Wales and of course Waverley as uh, the most densely populated uh, council in, in Australia. So, we submitted as part of the challenge and we led very much with the, the data uh, concept, the, the data, uh, the importance of data in, in not only just measuring the success of these PUDO bays, but obviously understanding are they in the right locations, how is it changing people's behavior and other kinds of behavioral considerations from that perspective. So 
we uh, we quickly got started uh, in in what you know what is effectively the digital experience. And so once we 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 got through the challenge, we spoke with the customer, we brought everything uh, together from a from a, uh, a you know a, a digital realm experience. We started asking ourselves, how can we take that physical curbside, introduce it to the app and allow people to start interacting with it. But even more so, how do we let people know this is here now? And this is, you know, and whenever you're starting a new service, whenever there's any kind of uh, uh, a change in, the, in people's patterns and people's behaviors, you have to find new and creative ways to change uh, and incentivize people to break their existing patterns. So the first thing we did, and this is really one of the key learnings for us, is we started thinking about the user experience in the app, what we're capable of doing at the time, if something required customization, and so we, you know, we, we believe very much in the power of searching. I mean, if you are close, of course, to a Pudo Bay, you should be advised that you're close to a Pudo Bay. And there's some things that we've done in the app to, to showcase that. But if you just know that you're going from your uh, home location or work location to Bondi Beach or to the junction, you should be able to search for Pudo, interact with it, find the one that's closest to you. So this video that you're seeing on the right hand side is just a very quick video of how within the Move It app, you can search for Pudo. You then, of course, get all your different Pudo options. You pick the one that's closest to you and that interaction then goes out to your shared mobility operator. So underpinning all of this as well, we're gonna talk about the project, uh, how we're building the project next and, and the partnerships is, you know, how do you then start fulfilling and, and optimizing which of these choices for shared mobility is most relevant to the user understanding their preferences as well. So I'll share a bit more of that in the following slides. But going back now into awareness and increasing the understanding of these Pudo Bays and, and making these, uh, you know, making them a success effectively is, you know, there's two mechanisms that we use and, and effectively three actually mechanisms that we use to A, you know, increase awareness and then B, start measuring how people feel about them. Are they useful? Are they creating utility? So the first one is, as you can see here, a very simple push notification. So in, in the world of, of apps, you know, push notifications are quite intrusive. You know, we use these very carefully, but we just wanted to let people know in and around the, the Sydney, Bay, you know, the Sydney Bondi Basin area, that there are these new bays, they're exclusive, they're safe. So we're, you know, we threw in a few catchy words to kind of grab their attention. And when someone clicks on this, the action then is to take them to the Waverly Council website on Pudo Bays, explain to them the Pudo process, and then of course show them the map where these bays are available. But what we also did is we created a push, um, a push, or sorry, a pop-up notification and a geofence boundary where basically in and around the entire Waverly Council, whenever someone comes in for the first time, and we set a frequency for like once a month. So even if you've seen it, you will see it again a month later, where when they come into the boundary of, of the council, this pop-up comes up when they're using the Move It app to let them know that there's a safer and more convenient way to transition from your uh, shared vehicle or private vehicle into public transport. And of course, the action, once they click on that button again, is to take them to the Waverly Council website. So this is how we can increase awareness help increase you know, the click-through rate, so to speak, into the Waverly Council side, and also then, of course, increase, uh, you know, increase knowledge of Pudo Bays and to help try to pollinate this concept. The third, the third aspect, and I'll talk about it more down the line with new data sets, is surveying, so qualitative data. Is this Pudo Bay helpful for you? And actually micro-targeting these surveys based on which Pudo Bays were used as well. Moving on from there, it isn't just about the app. It isn't just about putting a point of interest in or interacting with that point of interest. It's also how are we connecting better or how are we creating better connectivity into these individual areas? So there's a whole project that's been sitting behind this, which is currently underway. So there's a multi-step kind of project that we're working through. So once you could search for Pudo Bays, interact with it and hand off that information into shared mobility apps. So you saw Uber there, but of course there's Ola, there's Beam, there's Lime, there's Bird. The idea was how do we then start growing the network or how do we start growing the, the, the partnership, so to speak. And so for us, from the first moment we got this project and of course way, uh, working in conjunction with uh, Waverly Council and TFNSW, it was really understanding and, and how we were going to measure outcomes and which were the appropriate data sets. And some learnings that I can share with you there is that, you know, the simple answer is, oh, you just got to see how often people are using a Pudo Bay. Whichever one is you most utilize, clearly that's a great asset. But that's one very small aspect of what you know Waverly Council was trying to build. They wanted to understand if safety incidents, for example, were on the, were going to decrease because now there are these kind of dedicated curbside spots where you know where you could safely exchange. They wanted to understand if traffic flow was going to be improved. This is a huge consideration, you know, pre-COVID and hopefully in the post-COVID world as well. Bondi, you know, uh, Campbell Parade, Bondi Road on any given weekend is absolutely jam-packed. 
And you know, what is going to hurt that more than people just jumping out of their car in the middle of a trip and front, you know, quickly rushing across the road, potentially once again, creating another incident. So we had to think about data sets, what we had available, external sources, and really taking that data-driven view of pulling it all together. But a project, you know, isn't, it isn't, isn't a successful project without the right partners. So once we had the technology platform with Move It, and of course the idea and the dream of, of what Leo was building for Waverly and Transport for New South Wales as well, we then had to, we have a methodology we've been following to engage as many partners as possible. So we've reached out to about 22 different micromobility operators. You know, Shiba was mentioned, Go Get, Carnix, Door, uh, Lime, Bert, Ola, et cetera. And the idea is to really build a European style mass project here in APAC to showcase how the future of mobility as a service is actually not that far away. You can deliver these kind of projects now and then basically grow them over time. So we have a very strong methodology uh, in the back office where we're literally looking at, it's almost like a pipeline, who, we, who we've reached out to, what stage are we at in terms of you know, signing agreements, understanding the, the user experience, and literally working through this pipeline out of the 20 that we're chatting to, you know, we, we think we're successful and lucky if we get about five or six. So you know, there's also the numbers game and pulling it all together, but we're looking at you know, a spread of shared mobility and you know, e-scooter operators, et cetera. But then, you know, bringing it back to the experience design. So what does this all mean ultimately to the public transport customer? And how is this becoming more convenient for them? And what level of integration do you really need in the app to actually fulfill and create simpler trips? And so I have here a, a quick concept, which is L1 to L3 or level one to level three. And in the mover world, level one is quite simple. It's we're going to present to you the option of shared uh, mobility or micro mobility, et cetera. We're then gonna show you how much it costs and where you need to pick up the asset to interact with the asset. But at that point in time, we're happy to deep link you out into the, into the, uh, the partner's app so that they can preserve the full customer experience and, and of course, you know, uh, ultimately manage the interaction. All we're doing is aggregating the information and pulling it all together. So it's really important to think backwards from what the customer wants, how they interact with the product and ultimately how you can make it easier for them to use your, you know, your new kind of Pudo base. Then there's considerations around you know, the common language. So how, is all, how are all of your partners gonna chat to each other? And so we use what's called GVFS, the general bike feed specification. And it's quite a common and, and widely used uh, specification out there for shared mobility and micro mobility. But we can use CSV files or MDS, which is an up and coming kind of uh, integration language that came out of LA. There's other considerations there and how you can integrate, but it's really important you understand that to really you know, bring that connected mobility in and ultimately fulfillment. So you plan your journey, you know where you wanna go, you know how you wanna get there, but how do you actually pay for that and bring it all together? And this is where, you know, you typically do have to roadmap this out a bit further. Can you use your Opal card or is it just literally pay from the app? Or are you paying natively in the consumer's app? And you have to really think about once again, the experience and what you're trying to build from that perspective. And look, last but not least from my side and, 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 uh, and really just considering uh, what the power of all of this technology is actually bringing, what is different, why is it valuable to create this physical curbside and then, you know, of course, digitize it and create a digital twin. And it's only about understanding your riders, understanding their behaviors and new data sets. So this is just a very quick overview of some of the data that we can capture and share. But the idea here, and this is, you know, coming together now with the Waverly team and Transport for New South Wales is, where do people book from? Where are they actually going? How long are they taking once they get to certain locations? Is it close to Pudo Base? Is it far away? What's the profile of, the, of, of these individual users? What, you know, how are they accessing uh, mobility as a service? How are they accessing these bays? You know, what type of phones they're using, et cetera. But also things like origin of rides to key locations. So this is Central Station, for example. And where are these rides originating from to get to public transport so you can better optimize Pudo Bays? Or in this case, you know, an example would be which of these Pudo Bays are being used most often, which uh, over the course of the time of day and how that all fits together. And then last but not least, as I mentioned earlier, in, in the movement realm, and of course the Mobileye and Intel realm, we're very much interested in, in the future of autonomous vehicles. So these are, you know, live screenshots of a level four vehicle trial happening in Jerusalem, where the drivers got their hands off and they're operating very complex uh, traffic situations. But we need to know where are these uh, Pudo Bays in the future going to be best optimized and best placed so that autonomous vehicles can then interact with the general public in a safe and convenient way as well. So 
it all kind of plays in into the larger picture of you've got an asset. This is prime real estate, uh, the curbside that we're talking about. Is it really in the right spot? Are we disenfranchising anyone accidentally by keeping it in those spots? And then most importantly is how is it then influencing the behavior of users, pulling that all together to create a, a new picture, so to speak, of you know, the connected physical realm into the digital realm. And so with that, uh, we'll pull it all together. I'll hand it back to Leo and, uh, and share with you a bit more about things we've learned along the way. Thank you, Juan. Yeah, look, so pretty much um, we started with data. That was the, the, the first new thing that we did. We led with data to understand which areas were uh, more, most used. Uh, we knew we had uh, some budget issues, so we looked for the money. We made sure that uh, uh, these solutions actually are not, we're not building a building. You know what I mean? Like it's not, this is not going to cost you a lot of money. It's, uh, and, and because it, all the technology is there. Sometimes it is, it's more about um, connecting uh, different stakeholders together. That's how you build strong partnerships. And that's how, uh, instead of uh, regulating shared mobility providers, uh, we are actually now working with them towards better, uh, pursuing better deployment, uh, understanding more about where they can be um, and, and give them some space. Also understand where your project is going, but don't don't give it uh, too many objectives. This is an agile project, so just make sure that uh, you're not expecting something specific, and then the project is not successful. Because sometimes you 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 will have to 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 steer a little bit to make sure that you get where you want to get. And then that's it: measuring success and adjusting. Just make sure that we 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 are actually doing something and uh, some, sometimes measuring success also means um, getting more people involved that you were not expecting before. Like we, we have an organization that is wanting to do some camera, like uh, image processing on the pickup drop of base uh, to understand more, to give more data. And uh, that's a matter, a matter of success as well. Uh, if we were not the first, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be being asked to do that kind of thing. So that's, that's, that's pretty important. Thank you. And, and look, from my side, Leo, uh, j just to kind of close off on these key points is, you know, I think point number four really speaks to me the, the roadmap your project. Uh, there's always a, a very strong crawl, walk, run principle with these new and novel concepts. Don't expect uh, to, to kind of knock it out the park on day one, so to speak. You really have to start simple just make sure you've got the basics in place that you understand the customer journey well and pulling it all together and roadmap it out so you know even over the last few months in this project we're still taking learnings and adjusting and pivoting in a very agile fashion as leo mentioned and and ultimately the budget consideration i think is key too don't let uh, the lack of a big bang budget you know stop uh, something as simple as just creating dedicated curbside for shared mobility um you know sometimes if you build it uh, you catch the attention of others and, and you can find those funding sources and pull it all together. But I think it's really key that if you're putting out some goodwill, you're, you know, you're obviously interested in, in really trying to better your particular operating areas, uh, other things fall in place and, and there's ultimately a way to make it work. So um, hopefully this was quite helpful and, and Stephen, maybe I'll hand back to you now um, as our presentation is coming to a close. Thank you, both of you. Thank you, Leo, and thank you, Juan. Uh, that's awesome. Hey, I, I had forgotten to start to, to tell everyone, I, I, hopefully you saw the chat saying that you had a question just to post it, and some of you have. Um, but I have raft the questions, so I might just start off the process, um, and I'll ask the questions that people have actually posted. Um, Juan, you talked about, I think this is a kind of thing around uh, safety, but also you talked about partners, be about partnerships but where you've got you know, other people coming on board and you kind of highlighted one around, um, I think it's a, one of the questions being asked about um, abuse of PUDO areas and how you effectively manage them. I suppose in yeah. terms of having this partner come on wanting to trial some camera technology. Um, so you're going to, how, have they come on to provide you? Is that something that you've looked at, you wanted to understand how efficiently they've been used? And I suppose I've got a question around 
Now you talked about size where you had someone large and down to a single um, taxi rank. Now, is there a size that you're identifying that you need to have a minimum for these and location as well? And, uh, and location, as well as location as like, within the road. Yes, yeah. definitely. So um, the, the first thing uh, about, yes, uh, that taxi rank specific, we now understand that, so we didn't have many bays. So we try to put a lot of the put of base at the end of the row. So you have parking, 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 and at the end we want to have the bay. So people can approach a lot easier. And then this taxi rank is in between. There is a 15 minute zone and then a disabled one. And that one is the one that is being abused the most. Yeah, we, it, it's a trial. This is a 12 month trial. So we, we have to learn about it. There are no, there are no parking zones. So that has to be managed by the rangers. That's, that's definitely, a, but we also have to understand why these areas are being abused. And uh, yes, the, the single car bay doesn't work as well as the two or three car length bay, because then it's a lot easier to just approach and go out. Um, so yes, a, we, we, we're learning a lot about it. I suppose the other other part you talk about partners. Oh, I, and I, I kind of looked from the photo you had. I was going one bay that's not going to work very well. So you need like three or kind of four bays um, because they're and I suppose the time that they're used, uh, identifying from the data you're collecting, know what's the, the the high usage times and what's the low usage time. But you talked about no mobility as a service. You've got those partners where you want to actually. Okay, you're using your Uber, for example, you're dropping off and you want to use another partner's uh, active travel mobility device, scooter or, or, a, or a bike. Yeah. How have you gone about, I know, working with those partners to make sure that they have space available? They're not just like we have in Auckland, scooters everywhere, and they're trying to manage that, that, that outcome of, of the, cur no, the footpath as, as part of the curb. And you've got to have the space for people to get out of the cars and also walk um, mm -hmm. along the footpath. Yeah, so um, pretty much scooters in New South Wales are uh, illegal. So we don't have scooters here. Um, but there is a lot of space for, 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 for shared bicycles. And we're also thinking about scooters because they're going to happen. We have worked, we have understood the data. So we work with bicycle providers and we give them suggested pickup drop of base. So what they do is they populate that in their app. And then they, we're also going to be putting on, on the footpath or, or on areas that we know the, the, the pedestrian traffic is not going to be affected. We're going to put um, just bike hubs. That's, that's how we call it. We're just gonna paint a box so people can actually drop them off there and then in conjunction with the providers, they are actually giving some financial benefits to whoever leaves the bicycles there because deployment is not the issue because deployment, we, we, we talk with one person that manages operation. It's the, the, the end user and how they leave the bicycles or where they, where they leave them. Uh, yeah. So yeah, we, 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 we're working towards that. I think some operators manage it better than others in terms of forcing drop-offs or pickups from virtual hubs or you know virtual points where they won't let you lock out the vehicle or stop your your uh, you know your meter up until you're in these kind of pre-allocated virtual spots, whether they're in a building, a parking lot, or on the curbside. And I think there's uh, an, an issue of you know maybe a little bit of policy and a little bit of technology assisting to support that policy. But some some operators, I have to say, do it better than others and. You know, we see it here in Sydney as well, the, the shared bikes uh, littered all over the spot because uh, it's convenient to stop in a particular location. So hopefully the market's heading to a good solution on that soon. I suppose the question of, of um, how is that, is that data shared to those partners in terms of you know, they know how their, their devices are being used in terms of ones that are doing really well and others are doing poorly. So you're kind of getting kind of crowdsourcing to a, a, the optimal solution is you no, know, they park in the right place and the, 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 there are not those many providers and uh, users but yeah um just just in terms of a uh, going through the questions that people have so like pudu uh, one of the questions is 
uh, Pudo is the first step. Where does Waverley see the shared mobility and data usage heading for uh, residents' benefits? Yeah, so this is a trial. We see that this project is scalable. That's why we're working with Transport for New South Wales. That's the first thing. We know that the pickup drop off bay concept is going to stay. We don't know if the specific areas are going to stay the way they are because of the length, um, because of the location, because of the cost, whatever, whatever else. But in the future, we're gonna be using data for planning where we're actually gonna plan for our new uh, cycle ways uh, to have some kind of having capability where, where, where we have a hub for a bicycle, where we have a pickup drop of bay next to a bus stop kind of thing. That I think that that's the future. We don't know how much the reduction on car ownership is gonna be. That's, that, that's the bigger question, I think, because yes, we can be doing a lot, Sometimes we, we tend to think that we're doing the right thing and sometimes it doesn't have the impact, but on time will tell. And that's, I think that getting data from Move It, for example, that's gonna help us understand the, the, the whole picture a little bit better. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question is, no, is there a risk that by making parking easier, uh, even for short stops, yeah, you actually facilitate car-based transport, and and, it, and I think this is quite different for for Sydney. And as a consequence, discourage um, public and active transport. So making it easy to get an Uber and drop you off, no people are not going to uh, jump that, on their yeah. bike and and ride. That this is not the whole solution. We understand that we we are hundred percent. We know that like all the team cycles to work pretty much. We we we, we all do. Um, but this is a start. This would decrease car ownership and this would also help people that want to drive to the shopping center decide not to drive because they have the chance to be picked up after going grocery shopping. So yes, it's, th th this is not the entire solution, definitely not. But the other thing is that we, there is so much shared mobility with bicycles, scooters, cars, and the city doesn't show that. There is not really, there is no space for that shared mobility. So if, if, if it's going to happen and if it's going to help decreasing the use of cars, it has to start somewhere. I suppose that leads on to our next question is around that, you know, there's always that the view that, I suppose if autonomous autonomous cars increasing actual um, car based transport, and so I suppose one of the, the, the question is really, you know, um, what data are you collecting, you know, around to understand that Pudos are either increasing or decreasing car usage? How how are you, you know, looking at that question so you can report back after your twelve month period? Hey, actually, we have reduced car-based yeah. trips or actually the outcome is that actually making it easier for people to, to drop off and pick up at certain locations we've increased it but overall it might be a, a benefit it's yeah. always a really hard one to try and to identify mm -hmm. this was the actually helped or yeah. actually didn't help and and you know it absolutely and, and the other uh, factor to throw in is is now during covid affected times versus in a future world where we have full traffic back on the roads again so you know, we, we've workshopped this a few times and we've identified the, the key data sources. So we're in the process of kind of workshopping this. But the key things that we've identified so far is, you know, the simple measures like how, how actively these Pudo bays are being used, which ones more than others. Then we start slicing across different time resolutions. So weekdays, weekends, peaks versus off peaks to build a profile around that. But the missing bit is the traffic data. And of course, it's COVID affected traffic data. So we have a partnership, a worldwide partnership with TomTom. And we're exploring the possibility of pulling in, you know, telematics data and, and TomTom -tom traffic data to start doing a bit more modeling from this perspective as well. Also looking at things I mentioned before, safety incidents. So, you know, speaking to Transport for New South Wales and the council about seeing if we can find any trending information within safety incidents and where they're occurring. If there's any relation to Pudo Bays and how that may have changed over the last 12 months based on the, uh, the introduction of the Pudo Bay concept. 
and there's much, much more. So how, you know, if there's been an uptake in the use of public transport, um, you know, through the use of Pudo Base, because it's easier now to facilitate shorter first mile trips to the station rather than taking your car all the way to complete a trip. We're looking at these different measures and we don't have the smoking gun yet in the world of uh, big data. It's always a complex question, but hopefully next time we catch up, we can share more insights towards the, the middle end of the project, so to speak. Um, I've got another question, I suppose. It's been... How are you, no, how are you actually encouraging um, the providers to actually use the base? I think that that's a, that's a, a two, a two people uh, answer. The, on, on one side, we, we have gone on our social media mm -hmm. and um, we've, we've gone through channels like council channels to get people to do it. Then also the transport providers, they have integrated the pickup drop off base on their apps. So uh, depending where you are, if you are around the area, it will make you walk so you can so, so you can be picked up in that specific area. And Juan, what 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 have you done with with the move it up as well? Yeah, so so really good question. So from our side, it, it, particularly with the providers, all of these conversations started with a warm introduction from Transport and Waverly, so that these providers knew that this is a, a vision, a goal of the agencies and the operate you know of the agencies, and that therefore you know there's some impetus behind this, and we need to think about how this is going to uh, better facilitate mobility in these areas. From there, as we chat to them, we had to bring it into the digital realm, as we mentioned. So we ultimately got uh, the, the team at Google, which of course many of these different uh, mobility apps and, and you know uh, ride sharing apps are using Google Maps or Mapbox, OpenStreetMaps, et cetera, to do their heavy lifting. So now Pudo Bays are available within Google Maps. So anyone, uh, any kind of user that's using Google Maps or the Move It app or other journey planner apps will now see Pudo Bays. So once again, you know, making it easier to interact with these bays. And then ultimately, it's just about the ongoing conversations. And then once we have the data, the reports showing them how this works. And by the way, one thing to, to mention is it's in their interest to have these Pluto Bays because there's also a lot of cancellations, last minute cancellations that occurs with uh, rideshare partners because the vehicle's on the wrong side of the road. Uh, you know, drivers doing illegal things sometimes because they need to pick up a you know, passenger who refuses to go meet them. You know, so there's also a, an incentive for them as well that we regularly talk about and share to you know, to make sure that this is, once again, as, as Leo mentioned, it's not enforcing these things on, on our partners. It's actually just saying, this is good for you, it's good for us. Let's, let, you know, let's help the user learn and change their behavior in using these Pluto Bays. Brilliant, guys. We're coming to the end of everything, so I think I'll wrap it up now. Um, so thank you, Leo and Juan, for your, your presentation. It's been really interesting. Um, also, no, and thank you for being part of our TTX speaker series. And I also take this opportunity to kind of thank our um, gold and silver members, uh, and the minister, in terms of our gold members, Ministry of Transport, uh, Transport Agency, Fusion, Stantec, uh, Ford and Hogan and Becker. Um, without them, no, we wouldn't be able to have this um, these series. So thank you for being part of that and um, and sharing your uh, insights. And um, we we'll hope to have you back again at the end of your trial, and you can tell us how more it's how it's gone and. Um, hopefully, somewhere in New, in New Zealand, we'll, um, um, we'll trial this as well, because it's Excellent. certainly a, 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 an area that we do need to pursue. We'd love so to thanks, have Thanks, guys. That and thank you all for the, those who um, attended. I hope you've actually got something out of this and uh, take it back to your uh, colleagues and share as well. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you very, thank much. You very much. Take care. Have thanks, a good day. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye.